Hello everybody and welcome to our next problem. Still looking at tests on population variances. And of course now we're going to be looking at a two-tailed test. We'll see just why that's a two-tailed test by going through the problem. Make sure we can identify exactly what we're dealing with from the problem itself. Because I know on an exam you're not going to be told what the problem is. So again, I'm cheating a little bit. Call me lazy. We're just building on these earlier problems that we already looked at in module nine, where we were doing tests on the means, the averages of these distributions. Now we're doing the same thing, but on the variance or standard deviation of those distributions. So well, let's just jump into this problem. This is the one we're looking at, this water bottle manufacturing facility. They make water bottles designed to hold here 24 ounces. We know how they're made, okay, the plastic hardens, they put labels on there, defining certain volumes of liquid. The quality assurance team periodically takes a sample of 30 bottles and fills them to the line of 24 ounces of water. Then they measure the actual amount of water to make sure that the positioning of that marker on the bottle is accurate. Over the years, they've determined the population standard deviation to be 1.4. This has been the industry standard for variation in filling volumes for decades. And so this is the, the goal of the facility is to meet this standard. So this is telling us, this is telling us what we're going to need to be testing for. The most recent sample had an average volume of water of 23.6 ounces with a standard deviation of 1.82. Here we're going to use a 1% level of significance. So pretty small level of significance, meaning that they want to be really sure. They want to have very strong evidence against the null in order to reject it. So formulate the test justifier formulation. So what kind of test are we doing? Again, imagine we don't have all of this. Going through the problem, we see some clues, right? It's telling us a population standard deviation. So we've got a hypothesized value there. And it's telling us that the goal of the facility is to meet this standard, right? To meet this standard, the standard deviation of 1.4. So this is telling me that we're doing a test on variance or we're doing a test on standard deviation. You can write it either way. I always just work in terms of variance, but you can formulate this as a standard deviation as well. Either way is correct as long as you're consistent with your notation. And so because I am writing this as a test on variance rather than standard deviation. I have to make sure to square that hypothesized value. And so that gives me 1.96. So that's my hypothesized value. So I've determined here that we're doing a test on variance. My hypothesized value is 1.96. What kind of test is it? Lower tail, upper tail, two tail test? Well, you might think, reading this problem, it might make sense. There might be some logic to do this as a one tail test. Maybe you're thinking, well, I'm going to test that they're, you know, no more than that 1.96. So they're less than that 1.96 or something like this. You can probably come up with a good argument for why maybe this should be a one tail test. I always suggest sticking to the wording of the problem. And in this problem, I don't see any words pertaining to more than, less than, greater than, at least as much as, and I don't see any of those clues. I don't see any of those keywords. I see here's an industry standard, and the goal of the facility is to meet that standard. So their goal is to have a variance that is 1.96. The alternative is that it is not 1.96. So that's how I would determine that this is going to be a two-tail test. We're doing this at the 1% level of significance, so we want to have really strong evidence against the null. 
if we are to reject it. So we've got our test. Justify this. Well, if the evidence supports the null hypothesis, well, then that supports our, our, our target. That means that we have been successful at meeting this industry standard. If the evidence supports the alternative hypotheses, well, now that's indicative that we have a problem. We have not met this industry standard in terms of the variance of our filling volumes of these water bottles that we've manufactured. So if the evidence supports the null, we've achieved that standard. If the evidence supports the alternative, we have not achieved that standard. Calculate the test statistics for both tests. Okay, well, that's a typo. I'm only going to be doing one test. We've already done the test on the population mean back in problem 9.1d. So I'll make a correction to that final version of the workbook. You won't even see that. So we'll calculate our test statistic for this test on variance. Now, again, we have to remember we're building up this toolbox, so all these different tools for different kinds of tests. I need to make sure that I reach into that toolbox and I take out the right tool. I'm doing a test, a single population test on variance. The tool that I need is that chi-squared calculation and the chi-squared distribution. So this is n minus 1 s squared over the hypothesized value. Our sample size was over here. I have 30 minus 1. Here's that variance. And again, you can write this however you want, so long as you're consistent. I've been writing this as a variance. I'll write it as a variance here, but then it means I'm not going to square it, right? I could write it as a standard deviation, but then I have to make sure that I square it. So just be really careful because these are easy mistakes to make. And in fact, I just made a mistake. That's my sample standard deviation. That's this one here, 182 squared. And the denominator it would be that 1.4 squared. So again, avoid mistakes. I just made a silly one. Luckily, I caught it. But you can see how easy they can be, especially in an exam setting when you're a little bit pressured and stressed and you're looking at your clock and running out of time. You have to be careful because the, the mistakes are too easy to make. So here I have, I don't need that bracket. I have 29 times 182 squared divided by 1.4 squared. This gives me a chi-squared of 49.01. You already know the next steps because this process is the same. How many times do I keep saying that? It's so redundant, right? It's the same, it's the same, it's the same, except for all the little differences. And that's what makes it easy to make mistakes, is that it is so similar, except for those little differences. My degrees of freedom here, 30 minus 1, 29. We come down to our chi-square tables. I have, let's see, 29 degrees of freedom here. My test statistic was 49, so I come across and I see it's between these two values. It is closer to the upper one. I don't really care about its proximity to either. I'm just looking at the two values that kind of sandwich my test statistic. And so I have my two probabilities of interest. 0 0.01 and 0 0.025. So, of course, you're thinking, well, then there's our p-value. We're less than 0 0.025. We're greater than 0 0.01. And again, so much of what we do is the same except for all of those little differences, right? This is a two-tailed test. And so the same difference here exists as when we were doing two-tailed tests in module 9 and in module 10. When we're doing a two-tailed test, our p-value is twice that probability that we find in the tail of the distribution. So my p-value here is less than 0.025 
0 0.05 greater than 0 0.02. Again, right, this is an easy mistake to make if you're under pressure, you're stressed, and you're maybe not paying attention, and you're in this routine, you're doing this all habitually. Don't forget these little differences. So our p-value is between 0.02 and 0.05. I'll just rewrite that up here so I have it all together. Less than 0.05, greater than 0.02. Now, if we were doing this at the 5% level of significance, which is common, right? Many of the problems that we do is at the 5% level of significance. Well, here we would find enough evidence to reject. But again, watch out for these little differences. We're doing this one at the 1% level of significance. We're only going to reject if we have pretty strong evidence against the null hypotheses. Here I can see, well, my p-value is actually greater than 0.02. I mean, yes, it's less than 0.05, but that's kind of irrelevant for our problem. For us, I can see that it's greater than 0.02, which means it is greater than our level of significance. So our p-value is pointing us to a do not reject. Let's look at our critical value. Alpha 0.01, come back down to our tables. Same degrees of freedom. And again, this is very familiar to our t-distribution, right? Once we find that row, that corresponds to our variant of the distribution, just like we did with the degrees of freedom for the t-distribution. Well, you notice how we're, we're just, we're ignoring everything else, right? None of this stuff matters to us. Ignore all this, ignore all this. All we care about is that one row of critical values and of course, the corresponding probabilities. And so here I'm looking for that critical value for alpha 0.01. So I'm looking for, here's alpha 0.01. I come down here and I find our critical value. How am I doing? Oh yeah, it's a two-tailed test. What an easy mistake to make. And with the chi-square distribution, it's exactly the same. You've heard me say this, exactly the same, except it's an asymmetric distribution, right? So I can't just find that one tail critical value and then say, okay, it's plus or minus this, right? Like we could for the T and the Z distribution. For a two-tail test, oh, it's plus or minus 1.96, plus or minus 1.645, whatever. Remember those common values. Well, the chi-square distribution, it's asymmetric, all positive values. So what I want are the upper and lower tail values. This is a two-tail test, remember, which means just like all of the other two-tail tests that we've done, my critical values have to correspond with alpha divided by two in that tail, right? Because that level of significance, as it's always done, defines the size of our rejection region. My rejection region here is 0 0.01. For a two-tail test, I'm going to reject if my test statistic is either too large or too small. So I'm dividing that rejection region into the upper tail and the lower tail. It's exactly the same as what we did with the T and the Z distributions. Now, what I want in the lower tail is also alpha divided by two. But our probability table is only giving us upper tail probabilities, which means if I want that critical value that gives me an area of alpha divided by two in the lower tail, I need to find the critical value that gives me one minus alpha divided by two in the upper tail. So this one, let's get rid of this, oops, get rid of this. This one is going to be 
0 0.01 divided by 2, so that's going to be chi squared for 0 0.005. This one is going to be 0 0.995. 1 minus alpha divided by 2. Okay, now we can go down to our tables. And here I have 0 0.005, and here I have 0.995. I follow these down, and that gives me my upper tail critical value, 52.33. Let's clean this up a little bit. That's 52.33. My lower tail critical value, 0.995, follow that down, and that gives me 13.12. So here we are, we can clean this up a little bit, 13.12. Now just like the other test that we've done, that defines my rejection space. I'll reject if my test statistic is greater than or equal to the upper tail, less than or equal to the lower tail. The space in between is my do not reject space. Looks familiar. Where's our test statistic? 49.01 Here's 49.01, somewhere in there. Wouldn't you know it, it's in the do not reject space. So again, we get the exact same conclusion whether we're using the p-value approach or the critical value approach. We always do them both just for practice. In reality, you don't really need to, but as students, Practice, 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 right? So we've gone through, we've got our p-value, our critical value. Both of those lead us to a failure to reject, which means our evidence supports the alternate, uh, sorry, supports the null hypotheses, which means that we have evidence to show that we are achieving our goal of that standard deviation or that variance of 1.96. So we have evidence to show that we are meeting this industry standard for the variation in filling volumes. Once again, let me just show you that I am copying the wording, right? Our evidence shows that we are achieving this industry standard for the variation in filling volumes. Okay, good. We got through that one. That one was a little bit longer. But again, when we're doing two-tailed tests, there's some little things that can catch us up and can yeah, lead us to make some pretty frustrating, silly mistakes. But it happens all the time, and I know that I've made them, and I'm sure that you'll make them. But the more practice, the less likely you are to make those mistakes. I hope. Okay, thanks for watching, everybody. Bye-bye.